Well, hello, everyone. Hello, world. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2015 webinar series, uh, where we will focus on the role of technical standards in sustainable energy for all. We developed this webinar with Dr. Priya Ranjan Mishra of Philips India and Rainy Chang of the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and Engineering for Change as the director of E4C programs. It's a pleasure to see all of you here today. Now, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit about today's webinar. One of the global goals for sustainable development is affordable and clean energy. Achieving this goal requires scale-up of and manufacture and distribution of new energy technologies, things like clean cook stoves and BC microgrids, for example. But not all technologies created equally. Ensuring that new solutions deliver on their promises to improve health, livelihoods, and the environment requires appropriate international standards. In designing those standards, it is critical to consider new approaches and have a deep understanding of market needs. Today, we've invited two advocates in this field to share the impact that standards can and are having on developing countries. Dr. Priya Ranjan Mishra, who is the Principal Scientist at Philips India, and Rainy Chang, Director of Standards for the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. We welcome you both and thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series. Along with myself, we have Michael Meter of E4C and ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown and Jackie Halliday of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If any out there has their questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at Engineering for Change. Org. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge hub and global community of nearly 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, as we're talking about today, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. A membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources, and a growing inventory of field-tested solutions. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources and meet your needs and interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. Now, the webinar you're participating in today is part of our professional development offerings. The E4C webinar series is free, publicly available a series of online seminars showcasing the best practices and thinking of development practitioners. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on our webinars page. The URL is listed here. You can also access recordings of our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Our next webinar will be on November 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and our topic will be Sustainable Design Learning and Practical Applications of Whole Systems Thinking. We'll be joined by Jim Kaur, who is the founder of Core Ecologic, and Irby, set to be the world's greenest car, along with Mike Alcarzen and Katie Evans from Autodesk. Check out our E4C professional development page for registration details. And if you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. And for our friends in Canada, you're likely thinking that this falls at the exact time as Remembrance Day and uh, as the moment of silence. So please join us after that. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today on our webinar. This will be a good opportunity to also use the tools on the site. 
So if you see the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. I'll get us started and I'll type in where I'm joining from. New York, New York. Hopefully uh, we have some other folks from the city here today. I see we have uh, California. All right, we'll be waiting for other folks. I see some people answering in Q&A. We have Philadelphia, Minnesota, Chicago, uh, Charleston, North South Carolina. Please do enter all of your um, entries into um, the chat window. We have folks from Thailand. Very exciting. Thank you very much for joining us today from all over the world. It's really great to, to see you online. If the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking uh, the chat icon on the top right-hand corner. Any technical questions or administer problems should go into this chat window along with your locations as they're coming in. Feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin if you have any specific issues. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you have. However, during the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenter. This will help us manage the questions. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon at the top right-hand corner of the screen. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you're encountering any issues, try hitting stop and then start. That might help to resolve them. You may also want to try up opening WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH for the session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C webinars page. The URL is listed on the slide. So welcome again, everyone. Thank you for entering your locations. And with that, I'd like to uh, take a minute to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Priya Ranjan Mishra, who holds a PhD from IIT in Delhi. She's developed two kilowatt first rooftop grid connected systems in India in 1998. At Central Electronics Limited, he has designed off grid solar solutions and has been deployed across India. Currently, he is at Philips and he's engaged in the investigation of storage integrated solar DC grids. To his credit, there are more than 30 publications, 15 patent applications, and he has supervised 10 master theses. He is a chair and member of multiple IEEE working groups and societies. And in addition to his professional work, he's involved with teaching, management input, and fundraising for slum and orphan children's education. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Amishra, and we look forward to hearing all about uh, your work. Thank you, Aina. Uh, I'm thankful to uh, Energy for Engineering for Change for giving me opportunity to share my ideas and work. So um, uh, I will be uh, emphasizing on the importance of the standards in energy uh, distribution, particularly, and microgrids. Uh, uh, just for giving um, my introduction for my subject, you, everyone of us uh, are already aware that humanity is facing a lot of different global challenges. And if you see the energy is the most important one because most of the global challenges can be enabled, uh, solved with uh, energy input. So for uh, having the energy, uh, available to all the people uh, of the world, United Nations Foundation has come out a program, uh, Sustainable Energy for All. So in that, 26 uh, founding members have joined, and it's called Beyond the Grid program, so that uh, no one will be leaving, uh, leave behind. And through that, uh, that poverty, exclusion, and inequality could be reduced by five transformable shifts, uh, that is electricity, irrigation, roads, ports, and telecommunication. But you see most important is the elect, uh, energy, where, which will enable all the other uh, transformation shifts. In this slide also, you, just you see that uh, at least uh, 200 units of elect, uh, electricity annually is needed to change the uh, 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 from low uh, quality of life to higher quality of life. That is the inflection point. So how to uh, get to that level in a shorter uh, possible time? Uh, so we have, uh, it's a microgrid concept uh, which can be uh, 
is a scalable time to deployment is short it is efficient reliable because it's local and it's very easy to install in remote areas and even uh, in developing uh, developed country also us and japan they have now increased interest in microgrids because of climatic changes and terrorist threats threats the uh, microgrid industry is getting propelled uh, by the uh, uh, latest trends like uh, community solar projects are coming there are a lot of crowd funding campaigns are happening for uh, energizing villages in india remote area of india africa there are a lot of frequent blackouts is happening even in the grid connected uh, villages and towns there is a resource scarcity and rapid uh, everyone we of us we know rapid uh, changing climate is a issue dc microgrids on the other hand are also becoming popular uh, in comparison to ac microgrids as more and more appliances are now becoming dc and solar dc efficiency is 10 to 15% higher for the integration of batteries which is also D, uh, dc is enab enabling Uh, uh moving the market towards dc microgrids this is the trends you can see across the world more and more solar uh, uh, buildings are embracing solar technology there are uh, various kinds of uh, dc power architecture one simple of ac system i have given just for comparison uh, you can call that small dc ups as a nano grid or micro grid it's it's one of and in the below it's the simplest uh, micro grid which is shown with multiple energy source and multiple load these are the simplest application of micro grids in the next uh, in this slide you uh, may be seeing that uh, the whole system has become a uh, very complex so you have a micro a micro grid uh, which is connected to grid uh, lot uh, different type of uh, energy sources so for you must uh, uh, you should be uh, thinking uh, that the to connect all those things control the power flow back and forth you need a lot of communication uh, power protection and power controls all all, all those things and these needs various kinds of rules so what what are the barriers uh, which uh, is stopping or uh, uh, <coughs> uh, restricting the growth of the microgrid one is that uh, especially in dc microgrids one is myths and reality of safety hazards absence of standards from definition to deployment different dc grid voltage push from different application and manufacturer and then there is a different market size uh, is also not right now available because systems are in evolution phase uh, absence of a standard from definition uh, i want to say that microgrid sometimes uh, we refer to very isolated small uh, cluster of homes uh, uh, energy supply as a microgrid and many times a big campus like uh, the uh, <coughs> big university campuses which has their own dg sets or their own uh, wind farms they also form a, a, a microgrid so the exact definition is not there where we should call nano grid where we should call microgrid uh, microgrid should be connected to uh, how it should, it will be hybrid grid uh, when it is connected to the grid, uh, may, uh, the main grid so these are the uh, essence of even definition is not there so here i have uh, you can go through the slides after that but uh, i am just uh, coming out with the uh, whenever we have a discussion in any uh, talks uh, with the people experts then they always question if there is a dc and dc is more dangerous but you can see the last uh, letter of the things the hard factor f applies dc the same way as ac so whatever happens uh, with the ac current same happens with the dc current so 
and next if you see the upper and uh, below uh, the uh, two <coughs> curves are there and in both the curves this, uh, uh, are there is a comparison of effect on the human body uh, by ac current and dc current and in this case you can th uh, see that dc is slightly less dangerous than ac so uh, that's myth that dc is more dangerous than ac is also not true similarly if you go to uh, what should be the impedance for in non conducting environment so that is also same for both ac and dc similarly uh, there is a issue of uh, arcing uh, in the uh, especially when you break a uh, dc power uh, there is a issue of uh, arcing so nowadays if we see the whole thing concept is changing conventional switches are not there because most of the buildings or homes are uh, now controlled with remotes uh, apps and all those things luminaires are now fitted with pressure sensor daylight and temperature sensors so if the temperature rises or fire something happens it will automatically it will switch off appliances including luminaries participate in uh, demand response uh, and our network so they automatically whenever uh, uh, there is a shortage of power they reduce the things so and plus if you see that uh, dc power architecture can also avoid the switching so you you can have semiconductors and breakers or you can have ac power uh, circuit uh, on the ac side you can have ac circuit breaker so there are various arrangements by which you can mitigate uh, electric fire also similarly uh, if you see there are lot of dc voltages from usb or uh, this uh, charging or uh, lighting system to a very high plus minus 70 volt uh, systems are also proposed so it's very important ki which system should be applicable to which kind of application otherwise it's very difficult to get right um, uh, right efficiency figures and right safety standards so what standard do so in uh, by adhering to standard uh, one is uh, the consumer and the government body is very uh, sure confident about the product it is reliable and it is adhering to certain uh, norms so and if those things are earlier uh, shorted out then that becomes a uh, fundamental building block for product development it it is universally understood third point of this standards is important because of interconnectivity two products from two different uh, uh, manufacturers you can interconnect you are, they can talk to each other so interoperability all those things is possible otherwise there there will be issue in the future if one manufacturer is stop producing or goes out of the market then you cannot replace that product and the whole system of your microgrid uh, will not function so that kind of uh, situ we should not land in that kind of situation that's why its uh, standards are very much essential there are a lot of uh, uh, standard organization which is addressing right now dc system european commission uh, has a low voltage directive us uh, national electric code has come so that's uh, in 2014 they have included dc grid iec is also working next week itself uh, iec is organizing a first lvdc conference at delhi i am also participating there so e european committee uh, uh, has another uh, uh, standardization body so ieee is also working on that emerge alliance is uh, 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 working on uh, 24 volt and 380 volt and we have in india we are working off uh, with the ieee industry connection program so yeah, i have listed a lot of uh, ac uh, the standards which was already available for ac dc both or dc alone those uh, standards can be used by manufacturer uh, or uh, develop uh, system designer to develop a dc uh, 
is, is this right product. So you see uh, there are a lot of uh, standards uh, disease, uh, for disease systems. Generally people think that uh, where is the standards, the standards are not uh, available. So if standards are there, it may be possible for a particular product, direct uh, standards may not be there. It will take time, IEC is working on that. Uh, but you can always, ref uh, if you are in early in the product development, you can always refer to some of the standards which is already published. So these are the standards on power on Ethernet, which is uh, also uh, IEEE standards. So you can also refer to them. And there is another uh, 60 watt uh, power of Ethernet on four cable pairs, which is uh, right now in the uh, draft stage. So uh, again, I'm emphasizing on the uh, why uh, global standard is needed because uh, standardization is border, uh, borderless and evolution of traditional country bus model for standard development to market driven models. Because if every uh, country has their own standards, then it is very difficult to have uh, the um, uh, world market. And if the world market will not be there, uh, free flow from one place to another, then efficiency uh, all, uh, and the cost optimization will not be possible. So there is a need for a st uh, global st uh, standards and that will is, is for economic growth and it will be societal benefits. Now I'm coming to the last uh, part of that market size uh, of the microgrids. Which, uh, which was 4.3 billion in 2013, we are, it will be reaching around more, I think now more than 20 billion by 2020. And India has taken an ambitious target of adding 100 gigawatt by 2020. And I, uh, I hope significant portion of that will be coming from microgrids. So on the conclusion, uh, DC microgrid is need of the hour. Electric shock safety issue is similar for AC and DC. Electric fire due to arcing, etc., is eliminated with new control schemes and production devices. Standards are needed to build confidence among people and government to deploy such system. Evolution of market uh, looks very promising. So Thank you uh, so much. Now uh, I'm end of my. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Misha. We're we're definitely going to come back and, and uh, explore some questions around DC microgrids and standards at, at the end of the presentation. So for all the attendees, uh, do uh, feel free to type in your questions in the Q and A window, and we will go ahead and address them towards the end. Now uh, we're oh. going to move from uh, DC uh, microgrids to talking a little bit about cook stoves and the role of standards. So it's my pleasure to introduce Arini Chang, uh, who works together with a global network of testing experts to improve the evaluation and communication of stove performance and quality. As the chairperson of the ISO Technical Committee for Clean Cook Stoves and Clean Cooking Solutions, um, she facilitates multiple stakeholder groups to develop and implement standards, regulation, and labeling. She also oversees the Alliance's efforts to increase performance, affordability, usability, and access to a broad range of technology and fuel opportunities. Uh, Rainey has earned her PhD in biological and medical informatics from the University of California, San Francisco, and holds a uh, Bachelor of Science in Computational Biology from Brown University. It's my pleasure to welcome Rainey, who's dialing in, I believe, from Ghana. So over to you, Rainey. Thank you. I begin, I want to make sure my sound is still okay. You sound great. Okay, sounds good. It is a pleasure to be able to join all of you for this webinar. Um, thanks to the Engineering for Change uh, team for organizing this and bringing this together. I think um, as Dr. Mishra had uh, described in his presentation, there are many opportunities for standards to really help build uh, markets for a lot of these energy technologies. So standards um, in the cook stoves and fuel sector have been critical for us. And so today I'm happy to sh share our experiences, our progress, and also some of our lessons learned as well. 
Before I get into that in more detail, I wanted to start by um, introducing the issue that we're working on addressing. So, three billion people in the world use traditional stoves, open fires, and solid fuels. Um, this is 40, about 40% 40 of the world's population. Um, and what this means is um, people are exposed to a lot of smoke from these fires for cooking, and it leads to over 4 million deaths each year, um, and then a whole host of other illnesses related to the amount of smoke that um, cooks around the world are uh, breathing in. It's also an environmental issue with over 500 million tons of non-renewable wood fuel consumed each year in developing countries. Um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are uh, from traditional stoves and fuels is equivalent to 170 million passenger vehicles. So um, there's quite a lot of opportunity to, if we can improve technologies and fuels for cooking, there are potentially great benefits for health and for the environment, as also generating um, new income opportunities for people around the world. Colors are coming in a little oddly on this slide. I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to take a moment and introduce the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. We are a public-private partnership with uh, about 1,300 partners around the world. We're all working together to take a market-based approach to build a sustainable market for um, cook stoves and fuels that can save lives improve livelihoods, empower women, and protect the environment. Um, we have three pieces to the strategy. One is to strengthen supply, um, and the, the opposite side, which is not coming through on this slide, I apologize, is enhanced demand, so both from the consumer side and the manufacturer and producer side. As, and as well, creating an enabling environment for these markets to grow, and that includes advocacy, policy, as well as things like standards and testing. Now, there are quite a number of cook stoves and fuel alternatives to the traditional stoves and fuels. Um, I've included some icons of the wide variety of options here. Um, but if we're really aiming to build a sustainable market for coasters and fuels that will have an impact on health and environment, we need to answer these questions and be able to answer these questions. How can we clearly evaluate and communicate the performance and potential impacts of the different cookstoves and fuel options? Once we understand that, how can we drive the cook stoves and fuel sector towards better and better options over time? And of course, standards is the answer to that. Um, that's how we address those two questions. And more specifically for the different audiences that we're interested in with, for the consumers and users, standards provide consistent and clear information to help them make informed choices and purchases. Um, for designers and manufacturers, standards are a way to affirm their product quality, and it, it's a way to drive innovation um, and increase the competition in the market. Um, for national governments, for donors, investments, um, big implementation programs, um, standards are a way to be clear about what policies and investments people are making, but also drive the market to products with higher performance, high, better safety, um, as well as social and livelihood impacts as well. And then broadly thinking about the thousands of partners that are working together, standards provide, uh, standards provide a common terminology for expanding trade, um, so that, you know, when, when someone in one country says one thing uh, and, and wants to export into another country, there is some commonality, um, but also flexibility as well for national priorities. And that's really the next slide. 
The goal for developing standards, um, we often hear international standards and we think everything must be explicitly outlined and specified, um, but th that's not the case here. It's, it's usually not the case. And so what we're looking at here is how do we develop standards that achieve both international comparability as well as local adaptability. The international comparability helps trade and collaboration and local adaptability makes sure it's relevant to the variety of cooking practices around the world as well as different goals, different priorities that, uh, that people may have. And then at the international level, um, things that can help comparability are metrics, guidelines from methods, uh, reporting requirements, and these two sides of standards fit together in order to create something that's useful and impactful. So what have we done in, in terms of standards development? So the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves has, has partnered with ISO, um, where ISO brings the process and the experience in developing standards in hundreds of other areas. Um, the Global Alliance were supporting the standards development, were, were helping to bring people together for the discussions. Um, and really, it's our partners working together that um, are developing and approving the standards. And, and this is something that's critical to standards development. It's not something that's imposed from any single organization. It's something that is built up by the community. So back in 2012, um, we came together and developed an international workshop agreement, which is an interim set of guidelines. Um, this, is, this was done through um, a combination of webinar discussions and a three-day workshop meeting um, that brought people together. And that, that was something that met the immediate need, but Given the timing, um, it wasn't a complete solution at that time. So what we've done is continue to work on improving standards, and we launched a full-on ISO technical committee in 2013, and, and that's, uh, that work is continuing and ongoing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So going back to this international and national collaboration for, for a minute, um, this slide outlines the path that um, we're taking in order to have international and national standards work together. And so at the international level, we're working on resolving technical challenges, bringing the best methodology together, and at the national level, that's where adaptation to local priorities and practices happens, um, and that's where implementation and enforcement happens. And so you can see we're kind of going back and forth between at the, national, at the international level, resolving the technical challenges, adapting them, learning the lessons, going back to the international level, improving things in the international standards, and then going back to the national level for um, adaptation and implementation. So just to give a little bit more detail on this international workshop agreement that I mentioned, this is a common framework for evaluating stoves and fuels across four dimensions, efficiency and fuel use, total emissions, indoor emissions, and safety. Um, the reason these are kept separate is because different groups may have different priorities, so we wanted people to be able to clearly pick which indicators matter to most of them. And then also there's a tiered framework that allows people to focus on um, whether, where on the spectrum of performance they want to aim for. And it's, it's always a tension and a balance between wanting to aim high, but also being realistic to what's achievable given the current state of the market. And so this, this framework is really designed to provide flexibility. And so the ongoing work to build off the 
International Workshop Agreement, or the IWA, is happening in ISO TC 285. And um, the, the key stat that I wanted to highlight is a little hard to read, um, but, but what's really unique about TC 285 within the ISO world is that we have the highest percentage of developing country participation. So this is a, a standards effort that's being led by developing countries. Um, so we have 40 countries that are participating and observing, as well as several external liaison organizations working together. And, and I think this work is, is really a great example for developing country leadership in standards development, especially for a lot of these newer technologies that are specifically addressing the challenges and opportunities in developing countries. The ISO work proceeds through a number of different stages, and here's an update on where we are. Um, so we're currently working on drafts um, that we expect to complete within the next few months, um, and that's done by a core set of working group members um, at the international level. And then the next phase is then to go bring it back to the national level and get the input from different countries, does it address the national needs, um, and, and so this is a sense of how we balance both getting the work done with a small working group, but then allowing opportunity for input from many different countries. So all of that, these last few slides, we're talking about developing standards, defining the methods, the indicators, um, and that's the IWA and TC-285. And looking forward, we also want to start thinking about implementing the standards, um, putting the documents to use. And that can be done with financial incentives, labeling program, labeling programs um, with testing, different policies and regulations, certification, and of course enforcement of any policies and labeling efforts, as well as awards to highlight um, innovations and, and progress against the standards. So a couple of options. Um, these are some examples from CLASP and energy efficiency um, consulting group based in Washington, D.C. They've pulled together a couple of examples of different types of labels that we are currently considering for the cookstoves and fuel space. So one option is comparative labels that would have different tiers of performance. Um, it would allow people to compare different products and it typically displays more information. Whereas endorsement labels, they, there's just a specific set level. Does the product need it or not? It's a little bit more simple. Um, and so right now we're currently working in um, six countries to evaluate some of these labeling options, other options as well, in order to create the path award for that we're currently working on developing. Um, another Another thing that is related to all of this is we can have standards, we can have the testing data, but if it's not shared and used, then there's a limit to how influential the standards can be. And so the Global Alliance has also worked to develop a database of cook stove and fuel products that includes the specifications, things like price, size, um, how, how many people um, how much food can be cooked on the stove, um, as well as performance across indicators like efficiency, emission, safety. Um, and so this is something that's uh, driven by um, partners submitting stoves and fuel information and test data. And then what that allows the community to do is to understand what is the current performance, compare different options, um, as, as well as to facilitate a lot of the standards and um, development and implementation work more broadly. And finally, to wrap things up, um, we are, in order to address the health and environmental issues from traditional stoves and fuels, 
Um, we want to drive the market towards better and better options. Of course, we need to keep an eye on affordability and usability of the products, um, but performance also matters. And so standards and labeling, um, there are a number of different actors that can play a role in driving the market towards better and better products. So governments can set minimum acceptable performance levels. Donors can do that as well for funding eligibility. Innovation is integrated in this because standards set the goal and then innovation helps advance the market towards the goal. Um, investors um, looking into Cookstoves and Fuels companies can base their decisions on the performance and the potential impacts, especially impact investors. And then consumers um, can become more aware and be able to choose products based on labels. And so it's this, this, this ecosystem that we're working on building that is um, centered on a foundation of standards. And finally, um, I want to thank all of the people around the world who are working together on this. We have dozens of people from at least as many countries who, who are really sharing their concerns, their ideas, listening um, to all the different perspectives and really trying to create a um, robust and flexible framework um, to support the cook stoves and fuels market. And also thanks to all of you guys for joining this webinar and I'll turn it back to Iana for, for Q&A. Thank you so much, Rainey. That was fantastic. Um, we really appreciate the deep insight um, into both the DC microgrid, but also into the clean cook stoves uh, standards world. So with that, I'm going to open up uh, the opportunity for attendees to submit your questions via the Q&A. I'm going to kick us off with a couple of questions that have come to mind, and um, as the other questions come in, we'll, we'll add them to the mix. So, um, uh, the first question I have, and this can be, uh, I'm going to signal to you, Dr. Mishra, uh, to, to tackle this one first, and then perhaps you can have uh, Rini weigh in as well. So it's around the question of access to standards. So the standards you're advocating for um, in terms of DC microgrids, um, I, I know that you mentioned the potential of the market, but for those practitioners who, development practitioners specifically, who are leveraging DC microgrids as part of their projects or programs on the ground, working with communities, how can they access potentially uh, the standards that, that you are calling for? Are there any barriers that they should be aware of, whether they're financial or otherwise? How can these small groups um, be able to actually integrate the standards into their design? Uh, I think uh, that will be uh, one issue because um, standards are available at the cost. Sorry? So, uh, uh, what I'm saying is uh, there are uh, many free uh, standards which are uh, IC standards which have become o older. They are, I think, available at the uh, Google free of cost. But mm -hmm. for some standards, uh, uh, one has to pay for it. Uh, but if they seek the some of the experts who are professional in that, uh, like me, uh, so I can provide the, them the uh, I can guide them. To, okay, what are the, what uh, certain standard is they uh, is illustrating about it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, with respect to cook stoves, are there any barriers to accessing the current standards that have been developed in terms of the tiers that you've presented? Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, question. Yeah, I can, I can address that question. Um, so with the IWA, um, there there is a cost to access the the document. Um, but we've also, um, through the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves website, provided a, a summary of the key points to the standards um, document so that it, it can be more broadly understood and shared. Um, well, with the ongoing standards development work, anyone who is participating in the development of the standards has free access, of course, to the standards. So it's incentive for for people who 
who are interested in using the standards to be also involved in developing the standards. Um, and the other option for accessing the standards, um, because it's not just accessing the document, but also there's the associated equipment and, and training needed to be able to conduct some of the testing. So what we've been doing is helping to build up a global network of testing centers, regional testing and knowledge centers, and the knowledge being um, they're there to provide help and support to um, all the all the other organizations and also to help provide testing services. And so um, there are a dozen or 20 um, testing centers all around the world in um, developing countries, developed countries, where these are people who are going to be expert and familiar with the standards and the testing methodology, they have equipment and the training, and then they can work with others to um, start evaluating their products. Roger, that's really helpful to know that. Thank you so much. So I'm going to take one very specific question from the audience uh, for Dr. Mishra um, regarding uh, the DC standards. So um, this particular attendee wants to know, uh, you know, you, you, Dr. Mishra, you talked about the need for more standards in DC microgrids um, that and some yeah. standards are already in place. So specifically what standards for DC microgrids are lacking at, the time, at this time? Well, can you be very specific as to some examples? Uh, uh, please uh, repeat the question or you can type the question, it will be better than I can speak uh, uh, on the exact uh, lines. So, Exactly. If you have some specific examples of what standards are currently missing with respect to DC microgrids, um, we okay. can show examples of which ones exist. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right now, the uh, the uh, missing links are uh, the uh, correct voltage levels and the standards for the plugs, sockets, mm -hmm. or, uh, interface uh, termi uh, terminals, that is missing. And uh, because those uh, plugs and sockets are uh, most important part of the uh, power distribution, especially mm -hmm. in microgrid, mm -hmm. because uh, you will be ca connecting this to rural areas where the people will be coming with new appliances so uh, uh, and uh, uh, that they uh, they will be not knowing also so all uh, that area is missing right now on grounding mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again there is a issue of uh, di different grounding systems are there it's not very clear for dc what kind of grounding should be there so there there are standards but still we have to look uh, towards what microgrid uh, will have then there will be another difference. There should be a difference between off-grid, microgrid, or grid-connected microgrid. So hmm. these are the uh, things which is still uh, needs to be. There are a lot of gaps. But that's very insightful. Thank you so much. And I think it's a good uh, jump-off point for us to talk a little bit. I mean, uh, Rainy, you brought up the, the point of affordability, and I think it's a very critical point, especially when serving bases like pyramid communities with new products and services. So, um, Dr. Mishra, you're speaking about the need for more standardization around uh, specific design aspects such as grounding and sockets and so forth. Yes. So how yeah, yeah. do you anticipate from both of your respective areas that standards may impact uh, the cost of introducing new products uh, to the VOP specifically market? And, uh, you know, what, what are some of the implications, if you will, that need to be uh, considered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it uh, looks to me that once the standard will come, uh, then manufacturer will uh, start uh, uh, developing uh, those products because right okay. now in absence of the standards they they are not knowing that they will be allowed to uh, to market those products in certain region uh, or across the regions so that that's the, the dilemma if i come out with a certain products where, uh, let us suppose a socket 
uh, it, can it be allowed? Because uh, right now there is a no standard, universal standard. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to gauge what is the market size. So once the standard will come, uh, every manufacturer will be confident that their uh, product will have uh, passed certain regulation and they, uh, mm -hmm. there will be no uh, penalty or some kind of uh, thing uh, if, if some uh, other standards come up. Gotcha. Uh, Rainy, did you want to weigh in on this one as well? Yes, um, I think it's it's an incredibly important consideration. I think we have a lot of people as they see standards being developed that um, there there's the concern that higher standards will mean higher costs. Um, but I think we've seen a number of examples in other sectors where that was the fear, standards were put into place, and along with energy efficiency increases, um, prices also came down. Um, you know, it's, it's not all due to the standards, but I think standards are a way to drive the market, drive competition, um, so the end users are, um, have seen benefits in other sectors, and, and that's what we are um, aiming for here as well. Um, the other thing, too, is that, you know, the in, in the example of labeling products to increase consumer awareness and have them make informed choices, um, that will be side by side with the price. So um, it, it then turns, it goes into the consumer's hands to evaluate um, if there is a better product that is at a higher price, they can decide for themselves whether it's worth it. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's, a, it's a good financial decision because if you have a, a stove that is more efficient, even if the upfront cost is higher, the fuel savings for purchasing firewood or charcoal, things like that, that can um, lead to longer term savings. That's fantastic. So I know that there are a number of folks who are listening to, to this webinar and will be listening when we push out the recording, who will be wondering about, you know, what the timeline is associated with these standards coming into, into re reality, coming actually to full realization so that they can count on them or anticipate that in terms of their own product development or uh, their work. So. Um, maybe uh, you could both speak to when you anticipate, uh, and then I know it's hard to project, but uh, knowing kind of how long it takes to, to really bring a standard to reality, uh, where we stand uh, with respect to DC microgrids and clean cook stoves in terms of these standards perhaps being uh, fully rolled out. So um, maybe Dr. Priya will start with you. Yeah. Uh, Ayana, just I wanted to uh, give you another benefit of the standards. Generally, now, they, mm -hmm. whenever the global standards IEC or IEEE comes, uh, across the globe, experts uh, participate in that. So there is a harmonization of thoughts also goes in, and generally all market needs are addressed whenever now new uh, standards come. But that mm -hmm. takes a longer period because different aspects uh, uh, has to be looked into it. So once, uh, just I will give you an example. We have started working on the, the DC grid standards, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, for home, and that has started in 2014, sometime in October, and mm -hmm. now it's almost one year. So I think by the end of 2015 and uh, or early 2016, it will get uh, first draft will get published. So uh, while uh, drafting a uh, DC standard for home, uh, we have different working group. One working group is looking after safety standards. Another is looking after what is the market sizing. Third the working group is. Uh, uh, looking a, a, into the efficiency parts. Mm -hmm. So based on all holistic approach, the standards are developed. So mm -hmm. once it is uh, developed, it is, uh, I think, uh, 
very benefit to human kind and everyone. Of course. So, but that and that's taken two years for for that particular first draft. So we can extrapolate from that that the timeline is pretty significant um, around getting to the ideal end state. Um, yeah. Rainy, did you wanna weigh in as well from the perspective of the clean cook stoves? Yeah, um, it's actually something that we are we hear a lot um, that we have people who want to have standards as soon as possible to be able to use them, and then we have other people who say we still have a lot of unanswered questions about the mm -hmm. technology, about the methodology, so we have to wait. And the process that we're undertaking is to balance those two perspectives that we continue to iterate and improve. That's why we started with the International Workshop Agreement that is a little bit, um, <clears throat> it's a smaller scale um, effort than standards, but it allows us to have something in place. Um, right. And then as we develop the standards, um, I, I showed a timeline in one of the slides with the different stages of development and approval, but even after it's approved, it's something that we continue to revisit based on new developments in technology, new understandings in science and engineering. Um, so it, it's always an iterative thing where we're, we're trying to meet the immediate need, but also make sure that we are, um, we are considering the things that we still don't know, and, and making sure that we uh, we address them um, in a thoughtful way um, as we develop standards. That's that's very insightful, and it definitely speaks to the rationale behind these things taking a while because it's it's not about rushing to complete the standard, but more so about meeting the needs of the market and, and the practitioners, the manufacturers, the designers, all the folks who are working to deliver these improved solutions. So that, that's really, really quite helpful. I brought up the slide, I believe, that you were referencing with the okay. ISO stages. So hopefully that will give us some insight to our attendees. Um, so overall, I, I think the, the a resounding theme here is definitely the trying to achieve balance between ultimate benefits to end users and, and the needs of the marketplace. is It's tough. It's tough, but um, both of you are suggesting some approaches that could be effective and have been proven effective with the uh, global lines for clean cook stoves and uh, potentially there's some cross-pollination of ideas that could happen across these communities. I'm going to end on the, on the participant or attendee question here. That is a very practical one and I think one that demonstrates the value of the work that, that your group is doing, Rainy, which is how does an improved cooking stove be, can be included in the clean cook stove catalog? So maybe you can give a practical um, answer here on, on how someone's cook stove could enter the catalog. Yes, I can definitely do that. And I'm also going back to the slide on the catalog so that the URL is at the bottom um, for people. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, so if you go to that website, you'll be able to browse um, the the information that's currently in there, both stove and fuel products. Um, but there's also a submit or contribute button that you can click. There's a form um, that's submitted for if you have a a cook stove or fuel product, you could provide information on it. Um, and then we do some curation to make sure everything's um, clean and clear and consistent across the board. Um, but we, we do that in consultation with the people who are submitting. And then for testing data, um, that's something that typically comes directly from the testing centers who are um, producing that data with permission of the stove and fuel manufacturers. Um, so we have a number of different channels to provide information to the catalog, but um, it, it's definitely from all of our partners. I hope that answers the question of our attendee. And with that, that brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to thank all of the attendees uh, who have joined us today. For those of you who are interested in, in receiving a professional development hour for this webinar, please use the code 
that is listed on the slide and email us at the webinars at engineeringforchange.org or follow the instructions on the webinars page to uh, redeem that PDH. I'd like to thank our presenters. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Thank you, Rini, for, for joining us today. We truly appreciate um, your time and uh, your uh, wisdom of <laughs> having gained it through all this experience. So. Thank you to you both, and we hope to continue working with all of you. Uh, we remind all of the attendees uh, to become e team members, to get information at our upcoming webinars, and, and to learn more about the fantastic people and projects that are currently happening in, in the world of engineering for global development. With that, I leave you to say good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you may be, and hopefully we'll catch you on the next e 1st webinar. Take care. <laughs>